It's been 13 years since anybody added anything to the filters in Inkscape. Then along comes Ryan to add a perfectly agreeable, perfectly nice addition to support drop shadows in Inkscape. Right at the time when I'm re-engineering the, en the, the engine. God damn it, Ryan. Of course, Ryan is actually being really sweet about it because he's uh, reviewed my um, access code, the stuff that I talked about last week, and um, has committed to making sure that his new drop shadow code will actually work with the new stuff. And it's always great to see a new face who's contributing to Inkscape. So um, I, I joke about the fact that this is a um, conflicting piece of code. Um, but of course, in the free and open source world, this kind of thing can happen a lot. Um, volunteer contributions mean that um, you will get people who develop things that are overlapping or duplicate or entirely conflicting. And in this case, the in this particular case, there's a lot of um, code that isn't actually overlapping. It's just that uh, it, it will need some extra consideration. And I am uh, overjoyed, actually, that Ryan has agreed to uh, keep on participating in the project to make sure that his work uh, with the new interface and the new API will actually be tested, uh, including uh, CMYK. Like, he fully understands what the new Access API does, which is great. Um, okay, so... I am Martin. I'm an Inkscape developer and I develop features and fixes for everyday Inkscape users. And um, these videos, I talk about some of the things that have been happening in the Inkscape project. And most especially, I talk about the work that I have been doing in the past week. Um, and this work is funded by you guys. Essentially, you pay for my time to work on Inkscape to make sure that Inkscape develops in a way that you need. Um, for the past two years or so, I've been doing um, CMYK and um, expanded color support in Inkscape. This involves a non-trivial amount of changes. It's essentially a project that many developers said was impossible to do. And so we are moving code and code to make sure that like this um, functionality that we're developing is not half-baked. It's not a hack. It is properly supporting all of these things that we want to in a very um, efficient and hopefully laterally flexible way. And that's at least the, the goal, right? Um, I want to thank the people from last week's video who joined my LibrePay and who joined my Patreon. Um, big shout out to the person, whoever you are, who um, subscribed for uh, a full year at $10 a week. They upfronted $500 to support my work. Um, I very much appreciate that kind of commitment. Thank you so much. And to all of the people that um, couldn't afford to support me financially, but did support me by posting these videos and the message about Inkscape's development and your ability to contribute to Inkscape to their social media, media platforms and got attention on this important work. Um, it's just as important to make sure that the message gets out there as it is to be able to directly support me, essentially. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Um, so let's talk about the actual work that I've been up to. Um, I've been... I've moved to the color, so this is this this is going to get a little bit more technical because one of the reasons I haven't been making videos as regularly is because a lot of this work is really technical. But I figure in for a penny, in for a pound, I will talk about the work, and you can just skip over the parts that don't make any sense or um, are a little bit too dull. Um, I moved the 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 color management. Uh, support ser service API from our color CMS section to the um, the new access API. Um, essentially, it was assuming that you were always working on a Cairo sur surface, and I've changed the way our core CMS service is just basically you're handle handling it handling it handing it a bunch of memory. So it basically you basically say it's an image of this many. Uh, this width and this height, uh, this stride in integers or floats or whatever, you give it that information up front and it's able to do the color conversions using little CMS. That is important because um, we really don't want to, we don't want as much of Inkscape to assume Cairo, especially if in the future we decide to move on to um, using the GPU more or doing uh, color conversions, um, doing drawing exercise sizes, I should say, using other engines. Um, because, of course, there are lots of different ways in which you could draw things on a surface. We're currently using Cairo. Um, 
So this means um, we have a new generic services API. It's compatible with Cairo, so we can still pass those pass Cairo mem memory to it and it will work, but we can also pass other things to it as well. Um, I also made the actual uh, access API able to create contiguous um, memory. Um, so basically you can ask it for, say for instance, you've got CMYK and in Cairo land, that means you've got two separate surfaces, one surface for CMY and alpha and one for K and alpha, because you can't have CMYK together. There's not enough channels. So we draw it twice and essentially have two separate non-contiguous images. Um, in order to uh, make it work for things like exporting to images, I wanted to make sure that you can actually export a contiguous memory memory section where all of the pixels and all of the channels are together in the correct way. Um, this means that uh, you can export it to, to, for instance, JPEG, and you can just ask it for all of the bytes. Um, I wanted to make it make sure that you could ask it for 16-bit uh, integers or 32-bit integers. Um, or floating points, uh, whatever whatever the the library that's going to be used to um, understand the the resulting image, uh, and made it laterally flexible. Again, I, I want to make sure that this code is uh, essentially as compatible with the future it is, as it is possible to make, and then uh, we can make sure that we can. Um, Essentially, essentially, this 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 specifically the feature that I'm aiming for here is to be able to export to 16-bit PNGs. Um, the current option to export to Inkscape to 16-bit PNGs is what's known as a lie. Uh, we will just because all of the surfaces are 8 bits, we just expand those 8 bits to 16 and go here. Go here's a here's a PNG that's twice as big but like contains no extra information whatsoever um, which is a bit pointless so uh, the idea behind this is that a lot of that um, um, a lot of that code can now actually be fixed up so that it can export 16 bits pngs correctly um, we make sure that uh, other pro processes that might use doubles or, or other memory types are supported as well um, i have some notes here sorry yeah, I also needed to make sure that the um, the color transformation work um, could actually um, operate on these as well. So if you wanted to, for instance, uh, export a, a bunch of 16-bit integer images and then run a final uh, little CMS color translation on it to get it into the final color support, that all works correctly. It's all very uh, integratable uh, with itself. Um, I do I, I do end up having to make decisions about whether the f output is alpha pre-multiplied or not. Uh, so there's some extra options in the, in the API to allow you to choose whether the output should be uh, pre-multiplied. This is mostly because um, little CMS2 allows you to input pre-multiplied alpha channels, but not output them. So if you want the output to be pre-multiplied again, you have to do that yourself on every pix pixel. Um, I'm obviously writing a lot of uh, tests. That's actually what I'm working on right now is writing new tests. And I found a couple of bugs, which is great. Um, and I'm hoping for more code review. Um, what else is going on? Oh yeah, so um, so the core reason why I wanted to make the Access API um, this this flexible is because what happens is is that um, when you don't have a centralized control over some of the assumptions like CMYK and RGB, what happens is somebody will add a feature somewhere in Inkscape. And they'll write a whole bunch of custom code that operates on Cairo surfaces directly or does its own thing. And then you come to it later and you're like, okay, why, I, why can I not export to foobar blib using CMYK? It's just like the image is just completely black. And then you look at the code and you're like, oh yeah, that's because they wrote their own custom stuff and it's completely different from all the other code. And so what you want to do is make the, the assumptions that we're building into uh, our support of RGB, our support of CMYK, you want those assumptions to be in a in a in the smallest of places as possible. Um, I approach um, application interfaces API design in code as a design principle, just like you would with a user experience or UI design. You're trying to make it so that the the code that you write for um, is essentially for other developers and for yourself when you're older um, will be able to use the interface 
without having to care about or think about or remember all of the complexities that went into that interface, right? It tells a story about how to use the interface, but it doesn't require you to know all of the law, right? The, the, the background information about like how PNGs are actually compressed shouldn't really be important to you if you're just using a PNG interface. Um, you know, and the same thing for this. If you're dealing with pixels, uh, all you should really need to know is that here is an image surface. This is the color space that it's in. Uh, or if you need it in a specific color space, get me that image, whatever it's in, in RGB, for example. Right. And the only way you can do that is by perfecting the API design so that other developers don't feel put out or should we say tempted to write their own versions of the same code, which will have different assumptions and will miss things out and won't be able to take advantage of bug fixes and things. And um, just like with the color code, I've had some pretty good um, feedback about this kind of design principle where you um, essentially try to make, make code pretty, right? Make it uh, nice to use, Make, sure, make it like not uncomfortable for the person who will be developing in the future to look at your code, understand what it does or what it can do for them and use it. Um, okay, so that's your PSA for all the pro programmers out there. Don't neglect your design classes. Um, if you're a programmer, become a good mathematician, yes, but also become a good designer. It's, I think it's really, really important. Um, okay, let's talk about some of the things that are going on in the Inkscape project. These are things that... I don't do myself. These are the the project is actually very large. There's a lot of contributors. Um, almost all of them are volunteers, and they have all of our thanks because they're fixing issues and and doing a lot of work, which um, basically wouldn't happen without their generosity and their consideration um, to the greater good. Okay, so. Henrique has released a new version of his Dash icon set. If you're using 1.4, you're, you're probably using the Dash icon set already. This makes Inkscape really, really pretty, and he has uh, refined and made the Dash icon set even better than, than last time. Um, he's actually using my new cursor code. So, you know, you remember the video that I made about the cursor points and where the, where the position is? He's using that, which is awesome to see. I love that it's it's made this design process easier uh, and that it means the results are, are better, right? Um, Wen Wei Kao, I, I'm almost certain I'm mispronouncing that, uh, has been busy replacing the rotation snapping with a spin button. He's fixing uh, uh, or the unsetting of fulfill and stroke in the meshes and patterns, as well as a bunch of other things. Um, Ayun Das um, has been doing some fixes for toolbars and various other user experience fixes. Uh, he also worked with um, Kiri17 to figure out a really subtle bug that has been around in Inkscape for a long time, where when you open up an SVG file that was created in an older version of Inkscape, we would test the version that it was made in in order to do some compatibility. Uh, so essentially, if, we, if we'd if messed stuff up in the past, we put in compatibility code to basically say, if you open a, a version of Inks a SVG file that was made in Inkscape from this version, um, just run this code to like fix some things. That was broken. It was essentially, uh, it was an off by one error. Um, it couldn't tell the difference between 0.91 SVG files and 0.92 SVG files. That's a problem. And the thing is, is like the, res the result that he was trying to fix is that the, um, the templates, was it templates? Uh, no, to the tutorials SVGs were opening up wrong. And, um, he tried a couple of fi fixes first that, that didn't work. And then Kiri17 came in and, and provided context for, for what, what was actually going on and had actually narrowed down when this problem happened. And yeah, that I'm really, really uh, proud of them to have like figured this out and, and fixed a, a pretty important thing to, to get right. Um, uh, Charlotte Kurt Curtis, Curtis, Charlotte Curtis has been working on, um, the PDF input work. Um, she's been working on this for a while now, making sure that like all of the different ways in which PDFs can be broken. So sometimes when you open up a PDF in Inkscape and it doesn't work correctly, it's not actually Inkscape's fault. It's the PDF. The PDF can sometimes just be bad, but, uh, we want to make Inkscape be able to open up lots of things, which means be being able to cope with times when the PDF has been written wrong. 
Um, and so she's actually been fixing some bugs with font support so that it can read uh, PostScript font names that are that are written incorrectly in the file. Um, uh, Carlos has fixed issue with dragging, uh, dragging and dropping colors, as well as a lot of gesture fi fixes with GTK4. Um, it's some pretty important work to, to um, test and fix some of the things that are happening in the GTK upgrade that will be happening in 1.5. Um, awesome work. Uh, Rish Ab Singh has been has been fixing crashes um, in the tweak tool, uh, removed obsolete marker preferences. And, and Kiris the 17 themselves has been fixing uh, selecting layers when right clicking on, on them. Simple things. Um, as you can probably tell, there's a lot of people there. And a lot of them you probably have not heard of. That's because a lot of them are new. Um, as I said last week, there's there's a lot of uh, new contributors. And not all of these fixes are big. They're not features. They're not grandiose. Um, but they're, um, they're important um, to smooth over the edges and fix a lot of the small inconsistencies and problems. Um, they make Inkscape prettier. They make it easier to use. They make it more compatible with more, more, more platforms and hopefully makes Inkscape more accessible to more users. Um, so my, my thanks goes out to all of those contributors to Inkscape who maybe just fixed one thing. Maybe they fixed a hundred things, but it's, it's all really, really awesome. Okay, um, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching this video about Inkscape, and uh, I hope to see you next time.